Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Thank you for taking time on a Friday to come and be with us. My name is Marla Orenstein, and I'm the director of the Natural Resources Center at the Canada West Foundation. If this is your first time with us, uh, I would love to introduce you to, to CWF. We are an independent, nonpartisan public policy think tank. We have three centers, the Natural Resources Center, the Human Capital Center, and the Trade and Investment Center, where we do all kinds of great work most of which you can find for free on the Canada, Canada West Foundation website at cwf.ca. I am thrilled to have you come here for today's webinar, which is a fascinating topic I have been wanting to know more about for years. So I thought, let's invite some people who are experts and find out more together. Um, the title of today's presentation is Nor uh, Balancing Act, Norway's Approach to Oil and Gas Production and Decarbonization Goals. We have two really excellent panelists with us here today, uh, and I will butcher their names and then they can correct me later when they introduce themselves. We have Jon Alvedal Fredriksen and Asger Thomasgaard. Welcome to both of you. Before I uh, get you to introduce yourselves, just a little housekeeping here. Uh, we have both the chat and the Q&A functions enabled. Um, we are going to have a uh, time near the end of the hour when we can ask questions. So if you actually have questions that you want to pose to the panelists, please put them in the Q&A button and that's where I will see them and be able to pick them out and read them. If you just have general comments you want to make to one another or feedback for, for us or the panelists, feel free to throw that into the chat uh, where you can say whatever it is that is on your mind. So with Thank you very much. And uh, we will start with some introductions. Ambassador, shall we start with you? Thank you, Marla, and thank you for having me this this morning. Um, happy to to participate from from uh, uh, very uh, autumn in uh, Ottawa. Uh, cold morning in Ottawa this morning, but but thank you for having me. So my name is, is Jon Fredriksen, and um, I've been ambassador to Canada for now two years. I came in, in, in the middle of COVID uh, in 2020, but uh, uh, slowly but surely getting to know this beautiful country. And, and uh, I've, I've been to Alberta as well, uh, uh, but not to Calgary. Uh, I will go there next week, though, so it's, um, uh, look, look forward to that. Before I came to Canada, I, I was uh, Director General at the uh, International Department uh, in the Prime Minister's Office in Oslo in Norway. And before that, I was Ambassador to Ukraine for, for five years. So uh, my background is, is, is mainly in security policy. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And Oscar, over to you. Hi, so I'm Oscar Tomaskar. I'm a professor at Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And my field is in industrial economics and technology management. I'm also heading our anti-new energy transition initiative, and I'm a director of um, National Research Center of Energy Transition Strategies. So I work a lot with economic modeling and energy systems modeling and uh, interfaces to policy. Fantastic. Well, this should be a really interesting conversation, and I think you both bring a very different and rich perspective to the questions that we're going to investigate today. Ambassador, let's let's start with a question for you. Maybe you can give us a bit of context. Can you help us understand the historical importance of Norway's oil and gas sector to the country? So, uh, without going into to, uh, too many facts and figures, I, I think it's 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 uh, fair to say that uh, the oil and gas era uh, has uh, totally, uh, in many ways, transformed the, the Norwegian society through the last fifty years. It has uh, provided the government with, with revenues uh, to all of those decades, which had turned uh, Norway definitely into one of the uh, richest countries in the world and with a very high level of um, social security and, and welfare for the population, financed partly through, through the oil and gas revenues. Um, I think it's also fair to say that the model uh, that has been used in Norway for uh, handling uh, revenues from the oil and gas sector has benefited all of the, 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 the population of five millions through those decades um, through a very, uh, what you would probably call a very strict uh, framework and regulatory framework for, for the industry. Uh, this was not a given, uh, as we know, uh, around from, from experience around the world, uh, oil and gas uh, is handled differently in different countries and the revenues are handled differently. Uh, 
but for Norway, uh, for the whole society, it has meant um, uh, a lot. And um, of course, the the, uh, the 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 part of GDP and the part of export has varied uh, through the decades with with uh, with the um, uh, shifting tides. But uh, if we look at it all over, uh, it has uh, been a very high part of Norwegian export and uh, part of, of the Norwegian D GDP. And uh, there's no doubt that uh, uh, it, it is and remains today uh, by far the biggest export article we have with mm -hmm. seafood coming in as a very good number two. Um, uh, and of course, given uh, the situation that we have now on, on the energy market, um, both uh, the share of GDP and then the share of export has risen again in, 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 in the last few months. So uh, I think uh, the figures with that, that we have right now is that uh, uh, it consists about uh, the share of GDP is, is close to, to 25, 26% mm -hmm. of, 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 uh, of the Norwegian GDP all over. And, and exports are now up. The, the share of exports is up to, to about 50%, but it's not long ago. It was down to 35 So, of course, oil and gas is what it is uh, when it comes to, to, uh, to um, uh, you know, political and, and economic uh, tide shifting in, in the world market. Right. So, so very similar to, to Canada in that sense of, of its enormous economic importance, huge yes. sector in terms of employment. I, I pulled Indeed. A, couple, a couple of numbers just to, to get a sense of the relative size of, of what is Canada's production versus Norway's production, if I can just hmm. throw those in. My understanding is that um, current uh, output in terms of oil, I got this from the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate in August 2022, it was about 1.8 million barrels per day, compared with Canada across across all of Canada, uh, which is about 4.6 million barrels per day. Uh, in terms of gas, uh, Norway was at, at about 3.5 million square meters, mm -hmm. Canada was about 6.7 um, and for Canada, the percent of our oil that actually is exported is about 80% of what we produce gets exported. Do you have any, any sense of about how much of Norway's oil production gets ex exported? I imagine it's probably even higher than 80%, maybe? It would be around 100%, isn't that right, uh, Oscar? Yeah, for the for the natural gas, it's it's close to one hundred percent. It's slightly less for for oil, but but Norway is still, I think, among the top ten exporting countries in the world. So so the volume of export of oil is is tremendously high compared to what we use ourselves. Indeed, yeah. right. we think, but we will probably touch upon it a bit later. But 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 mm -hmm. for Norway, Norway is also blessed with with the hydropower. So uh, oil and gas has never been used, say, for electricity purposes in Norway, mm -hmm. and still is not. Right. Somebody asked for the statistics again. I'll throw them into the chat in a minute. Um, so let's talk about the approach that Norway has been taken to decarbonizing the energy sector. Have targets been set by government for reducing emissions from energy production? And whoever wants to take this can start. I guess I can, I, I can start. So uh, I think we have set uh, national wide uh, emission targets. So we want to be a, a net zero society in 2050, and we want to reduce emissions between 50 and 60% economy wide before 2030. And considering that um, our power sector is more or less emission free, and, and our petroleum sector has a quarter of the total Norwegian emissions, around 12 million tons per year, currently, uh, obviously, the, the petroleum sector will take, need to take a heavy lift in, in terms of reducing emissions. and. Uh, and and towards uh, towards 2030, we, we probably are uh, in the ballpark of, of the economy. Uh, we need to do 50 to 60 percent also in the petroleum sector, but before 2030. Mm -hmm. So, what what sort of an approach uh, is being taken to reach those targets? Is it, is it mostly sticks, like meaning regulations and penalties, or is it mostly carrots, financial incentives, financial support? Or is there a, a, a bit of both that is being offered by the government to the sector? I, I think it's fair to say that it's, it's a mix. Uh, I mean, carbon pricing has been in, in, in place in Norway for a long time. Uh, and I think to, uh, as of today, uh, it's not probably contested in the same way that, that we see in Canada. Uh, and uh, so, so, so carbon pricing is definitely a part of it. Um, 
also you have to keep in mind that the the taxation of of the industry in Norway is is very very heavy. Uh, we're talking about I think um, effectively uh, far above eighty percent taxation from 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 the industry as such. So uh, I think if you look at the the government approach uh, overall, you know how, how does the future look? Uh, I think this government we have now, as well as previous governments uh, from the other side of the aisle, has realized that uh, oil and gas is not something that will last forever. Uh, transition will be necessary, not only because the resources run out, but because of climate change, obviously. So, so there seems to be a good consensus um, across the aisle in the Norwegian parliament that we need to address those issues and a and, and, uh, good consensus that... Uh, given how the Norwegian economy works, that would mean for the government to encourage the industry to use the uh, innovation, the resources, uh, their money uh, and their know-how to transit into also renewables and mm -hmm. into new technologies that can uh, still lower the emissions from the oil and gas extractions that will be going out, out on for uh, years to come still. So uh, you will not see uh, a policy from, from Norway with which uh, caters to uh, abruptly ending oil and gas extraction. We realize that especially uh, natural gas uh, will be a transit uh, uh, fuel, if you like to put it that way, to, to, uh, when we transit to renewables for, for a time to come. And the extraction going on on the Norwegian shelf is, is um, um, among the less polluting uh, extractions uh, around the world. So we will, be, we will keep delivering uh, natural gas to our partners in Europe uh, for a long time to come. But there are a lot of government programs across the board uh, to encourage transition to, to renewables and also to uh, encourage the development of uh, CCS um, technology. And you have uh, full-scale um, research, uh, CCS research facility in Norway. You have also government-supported a full-scale um, project called uh, Melange, which was supposed to, to um, uh, help us do that transition. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and the latest, um, initiatives from, from, from the current government is also to start now giving out licenses to ocean wind projects um, along the Norwegian coast. It's happening as we speak. Yeah, it's fascinating. As, can I ask you to, to, um, to also give us your, your perspective on sticking with the oil and gas sector for a minute. How has that sector responded so far? Are, do, they, do they seem to be on board with the targets and are they on track to meeting the targets that have been set? Uh, I think the, the, the one of the main instruments that's been used so far is electrification of oil and gas platforms. And, and I think uh, when you look at the possibilities of taking electricity from, from the onshore power grid and combine that with uh, increasing uh, CO2 tax uh, approaching 100 and 200 dollars per ton CO2, you get very clear incentives to use electrification where electrification is possible. And, and you can say the, the oil and gas industry has taken this opportunity, but also looked at the option to build offshore wind so that you could say that uh, instead of taking uh, electricity only from the onshore system, uh, maybe stressing the onshore power system, uh, in the future, it's very likely that a lot of the electricity resources that's going to be used on the continental shelf will come from the North Sea itself through offshore wind developments. So you see a quite progressive industry in terms of looking at the options to utilize the renewable resources also available in the North Sea. And, and, and that might be a good strategy if, if you look at it to, to, to say that uh, while we make the oil and gas industry cleaner for, for the coming years, we, we start diversifying by supplementing that activity with building renewable resources and carbon capture and, and storage infrastructure, as was, was mentioned, so that you could decarbonize also the end products in terms of, for example, natural gas going into hydrogen, where you, where you capture the, the CO2 in the process. So, so you talk about the, the the response from the sector being fairly progressive. I know one of the big differences between Canada and Norway is that um, Equinor, which is Norway's largest producer of, of energy, is state-owned. 
how, how much of a difference has that made in terms of, of getting the, the whole sector and that part of the industry on side and on board, willing to, oh. to make the changes, to make the targets? So, so Equinor, uh, as it is today, is partly state-owned. Um, uh, before, when it was called Statoil, it was partly privatized. If we go, uh, well, time flies, it must be 20 years back or something, that we started to privatize parts of it. But it, I mean, the Norwegian government is, is a huge shareholder uh, with Equinor. And I think what you're implying is, is right that, uh, of course, this, this influences how the sector developments in Norway, when you have a very big uh, actor on the shelf, not the only one, we have a lot of, of, of foreign companies operating um, wells and, and, and fields in, in the Norwegian shelf, but it sets a standard for, for, for how to proceed and it sends a sig clear signal to, 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 uh, to the whole uh, industry in Norway uh, that you know we need to take all the know-how that you have uh, and the resources that you have, and we need to use them for transition. So, uh, when when Oscar says that the, that the industry is, is is fairly progressive, I think of course it's incentives to make money in the future, but it is also taking um, uh, clearly political signals and to work with the government and and with other parts of Norwegian economy uh, instead of working against it. it makes make sense. I I have one more. Um like oil and gas specific questions before I, I really want to broaden out to the energy transition more more broadly. One of the themes that we often hear in Western Canada is that the cost of decarbonizing oil and gas, all the things that are needed, CCUS, electrification, et cetera, are going to be so expensive that it will make Canadian oil and gas uncompetitive with the global market for for um, for oil and gas, it, are are you seeing this in Norway? Has Norway's oil and gas suddenly become so expensive because of these measures that that it is uncompetitive and and doesn't provide a return, or or has that been able to um, not be a problem? Can can comment on that. My impression is that. Uh, the Norwegian oil and gas companies see that uh, uh, it's positive for the industry that you can show uh, even if the products that you sell have CO2 and, and will potentially emit CO2 when they are used, that at least the production of the products is clean and, and that gives a comparative advantage that you reduce the emissions and, and environmental impact of the production phase. And uh, I think that's seen as a competitive advantage in, in a changing world where oil and gas also needs to demonstrate that even if the products contain CO2, the production process itself is as clean as it can, can be. So I, I don't see uh, any negativism in, in, in the Norwegian industry on that fact. I think the, the combination of realizing that the cost of pollution will go up as we see through the EU ETS price and, and the CO2 tax in Norway uh, uh, and and the realization that uh, it, it, it will be a requirement that uh, that emissions go down in, in all phases of the value chain. I, see, I think this is more seen as a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay, so pivoting now to, to the energy transition more broadly, I, I'm interested to hear about how Norway has been progressing in all kinds of things like biofuels, hydrogen, we've had a question from the audience somewhere around nuclear and whether there's plans there, CCUS. Um, can you tell us about, about um, the, the strides that Norway has been making in, in the, the energy transition writ large and, and where it sees its strengths? So I can start off maybe on on, on the policy side and, and uh, Oscar can, can follow up. I, I so uh, as I said, the general approach is that that we should actually uh, not only encourage but also actively uh, make it possible for for the for our society to to transit to a carbon neutral future. That's the stated goal, um, not only inside the country but also to contribute to that uh, globally. So what you will find if you take sort of a closer look at Norway as such is that there are a, a whole range now of government agencies um, and support programs for, for making that transition, uh, uh, ranging from an agency that will support small and medium-sized businesses, even you know, uh, uh, private communities to, to, uh, to, uh, to transit into more energy efficient ways of, of, of operating uh, or transiting to, to um, less emission intensive uh, ways of, of, of um, 
powering uh, powering their activities, you will have a state agency uh, for actually uh, investing now uh, in in uh, projects to reduce emissions. So, uh, state and investment fund, you will have uh, lots of progress on uh, programs under the Norwegian Research Council, uh, Innovation Norway, which is our um, uh, business promotion uh, agency, will have will have several programs. And also you will have actually uh, agencies that are working specifically uh, with the development of hydrogen um, uh, uh, and CCS. Um, also, uh, Norway is, has always been and still is uh, a big shipping nation uh, and green shipping uh, is very much something the government is, is, is uh, working with. So a lot of uh, state aided or funded programs to develop electrification of, of uh, the, the national um, shipping industry, uh, full-scale uh, uh, projects with, with hydrogen-powered uh, vessels, even ammonia-powered vessels. Uh, you will see the whole range of um, projects being now implemented in, in, in Norway. So. The whole idea of having this dilemma that that uh, you put in the, in, in the in the um, uh, title uh, in the, head, the headline <laughs> of today's seminar is is of course it's there it's it's there by default, uh, but I think that that um, in, in Norway we have sort of uh, in to a sense put that discussion a little bit behind us and and, and it's it's full steam ahead to try to do both. Uh, and, and continue to have a, a, a responsible <clears throat> extraction of oil and gas, and then you know do do full steam ahead on on all other fronts to make the the transition that we have to do make not on our own but together with European partners and, and other partners um, internationally. That that's really interesting, and Professor uh, Thomas Card, while, while I definitely want to hear your 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 thoughts on the energy transition, because as the director of the center, you will have lots. I just wanted to note one thing that 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 you said, Ambassador, that was quite interesting to me, which was about the green shipping, because it, it to me that answers one part of this piece about how do you oil and gas is very easy to export electricity, for example, some of the other things are not. How do you turn this into an economic opportunity for a country? And that to me is an example of a value add where you you produce energy locally, but then you also turn it into something that needs to be an energy consumer. And essentially that, the green shipping is what becomes the, the end product that provides the economic return. So I, I, I find that example extremely compelling. So Professor Thomas Gard, can, we, can we turn to you? You have really interesting insight into many different aspects of the energy transition. Where do you see this going? What are, what are the primary areas that Norway itself uh, is really trying to, to push forward, and how's it going? I, I think um, Norway's starting point has been been very good since we have a power system which is more or less 100% renewable. But I think going back 10 years, the Norwegian government, industry, and the research organizations in universities started around 11 centers on uh, environmentally friendly energies. It was on carbon capture and storage, it was on wind energy, it was on solar energy, uh, it was on bioenergy, a number of these technologies. And I think that was a very important step to take already 10 years back to start preparing uh, both the educational uh, programs, the, the research focus and the industry to to uh, be prepared to the transition. Uh, and, and it's important to remember that uh, when we talk about the transition, the energy transition, it's, it's not just about transitioning the energy system, it's how can the energy system help transitioning the transport sector, the, the, the industry and, and the built environment. And uh, for me, a lot about uh, the energy transition is how do you get the people, the technologies, and the systems like the energy system and the transport system to interact in a, in a way that makes it possible to decarbonize uh, at the same time, keep up the service level and the quality of, of the services we have been uh, seeing. And uh, in order to make that happen, you need to 
of course, do this gradually, but you need to change in some cases both the ways that we use these services and systems and the technologies and the fuels that go into them. So it's what we could call a deep decarbonization of society, where it, it goes into to, to all details in, in how we are doing this where I think the, the energy is a very important part. It's necessary to make it happen, but it also needs to, to, to uh, materialize into to new industrial processes, new, uh, new uh, ways of using the transport system, the way we build the urban environment, and, and all these aspects. So, so for me, the energy transition is, is one important part of the transition of society. And, and in Norway, I think... Um, we are starting to realize uh, this as we see, uh, for example, how do we decarbonize the, the transport sector? And you mentioned maritime transport as, as one example. And I think that's a nice example because it combines the idea about decarbonizing uh, a difficult to abide sector at the same time maybe having the ability to build new industry in terms of, uh, for example, the vehicles, the ships that are going to run on hydrogen or being hybrid uh, in, instead of running on diesel. So at the same time, you're decarbonizing a difficult sector, but we're also creating new opportunity and possibilities for green growth. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the deep decarbonization you're talking about, I, um, I, I'm curious to poke into that a little bit more because every country has their own unique set of challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. The challenges for a, a country that faces extreme cold, like Norway or Canada, is different than one that faces extreme heat. Something that's mm -hmm. very spread out and diverse is quite different than something that is is compact and small. What are the specific challenges that that Norway has, Asger, in terms of um, this deep decarbonization and transformation of society? What are some of those those big hurdles that that just just the geography and situation of Norway? Um, that, that you were facing because of those? Yeah, so, so we are in a good position because our heating system is very much electric. Uh, mm -hmm. And that means that uh, when we are going to reduce emissions, we need to attack some of the sectors that uh, are difficult. So we need to be early movers in, in, uh, in some of these sectors. Like for transport, when we started supporting battery electric vehicles, we were much earlier than many other countries in support schemes for those. And it means we also very successfully transitioned the the part of the transport sector that is related to to um, to vehicles for person transport. Mm -hmm. uh, now we will try to repeat the same in in the maritime sector, and we see that's a more difficult to abide sector, and it's not that many uh, solutions available. So, so I, I think that's both a difficulty and an opportunity for us mm -hmm. to do that in the transport sector. We will face the same in industry when we start looking at the different 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 industrial sectors we have in Norway. Many of them energy intensive. And even if they are depending on electricity, there are also process emissions from some of these uh, industries. And, and we will have to find ways of reducing emissions from those process industries in, in years to come. We had a question from the, the audience that I'm also interested in, which is right now, what percentage of, of Norway's electricity comes from hydro or water? Do you it's close to 100, isn't it? Yeah, around yeah. 98, 98 percent. We have a yeah. little bit more wind <laughs> coming in, so but it's it's very close indeed. But but wind power is becoming more important year by year. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And and as you, as you may know, it, it we have a lot of hydro in Canada, but mm -hmm. only in some regions and and others not at all. Uh, we're mm -hmm. out here on the prairies. There is no water to uh, <laughs> use. So uh, so that's very interesting. Can you tell me about uh, hydrogen and what what um, what plans Norway has for for really ramping up hydrogen? both the production of it, but also the use of it, the infrastructure for it, because I know that these are all parts that all have to rise at the same time. It, it's that chicken and egg of, you need the production, but you also need a market and you need a, a way to get the production to market. So what 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 is Norway thinking on the, on the hydrogen side? I think the, the old... So, so just a, a few words from from me then on, on the overall mm -hmm. again, uh, approach from, from the government, which would be to, to uh, the, declared goal of, of setting up a full value chain uh, for both blue and, and, and green hydrogen, which is very ambitious. Uh, uh, but there is, uh, you know, big focus on, on, on this from, from, from the government side to, to uh, develop uh, sort of the, the whole range of, of uh, capacities when it comes to, to, to hydrogen. There is, a, I think it's fair to say that there is a sort of historic um, 
uh, competence in Norway, uh, know-how in Norway on hydrogen, but has to do with, with us being a huge fertilizer uh, mm. um, producer back uh, back in the days, so still are, but but um, so so it's not entirely new as such. Uh, but of course, the ambitions that we see now are are uh, uh, very much uh, bigger and 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 focused on on uh, making uh, sort of full scale. Um, a transition into to using hydrogen uh producing exporting using uh, hydrogen so um, i'm sure the professor can go into more details hmm. yeah it's um it's true and um and, and i think Norway's a good position again as we have this uh, long and uh, strong history on electrolysis and producing hydrogen from electricity and we also have natural gas and we are building co2 infrastructure so we could produce blue hydrogen where you use steam reforming to to produce hydrogen from natural gas and you capture the CO2 and restore it permanently. So the, the challenge, um, there are two challenges as I see it. One of them is you need to do like John is saying to build uh, this complete value chains where you build the supply side and demand side at the same time because you really need to, to have use areas for hydrogen as well. And I think these early demonstrations will um, mainly be within uh, within uh, maritime value chains uh, and, and hydrogen coming for electrolysis. As the volume scales up, uh, I think steam reforming would be an alternative. But then we go to the second challenge, which is the energy scarcity that we see in Europe these days, where both clean electricity uh, or electricity in general and natural gas is, is a, are scarce resources. And uh, of course, hydrogen comes from those two resources. So it's going to be a, a difficult puzzle on how to prioritize uh, the, the energy resources in Europe in, in, in years to come. I see in, in the EU ambition, there is uh, ambition to have uh, 10 million tons of, of hydrogen produced internally in EU and importing 10 million tons of hydrogen, which in, in some cases will come from Norway. But it's really going to be tough to, to find the energy to produce these volumes of hydrogen in years to come. From a Norwegian perspective, that means if we want to be in that uh, the supply chains, we should probably build more renewables uh, pretty pretty quickly to be able to provide that. It also means that in the long term, if you want to be a provider of, of blue hydrogen into those with those kind of volumes into those markets, we probably need to find more natural gas as well. Fair enough. And and a question again that, that I have and an audience member also wanted to know is, is does Norway have plans for nuclear um, in the future as well? Not as far as I'm uh, aware of, no. Um, we don't have the tradition to do that. There has traditionally been re big resistance in the population to, to nuclear power. Um, we are part. We are part of the the uh, the Nordic uh, electricity exchange, um, which means that uh, we do, in fact, you know, um, uh, get uh, uh, nuclear power from Finland and Sweden into our mix. Uh, um, however, that works in practice, but but uh, nuclear power in in Norway is, is not on the agenda as far as I have uh, been able to to see. And uh, I think a few years back, uh, when there were a lot of discussion internationally about new uh, fuels, new kind of fuels for for nuclear energy, uh, thorium was a big uh, buzzword for a while. Uh, I think there are the process of that in Norway, but. Um, not that I'm aware of, no. Yeah, so in, in our power market models, we do analysis of this. The, the main problem with nuclear in, in, in those models is it's too expensive. It takes too long time mm. to build. And uh, if you add the, the social dimension, it hasn't been that popular. So I see that more and more people also in Norway talk about small modular reactors and that I, that they might be part of the future. Uh, I, I see also discussions, some companies in Norway that would like to build those. I also noticed yesterday the Minister of Oil and Energy being very clear in a statement saying this is not relevant for Norway. So that's the situation at, at this stage. I think you will find that that ocean wind is is the buzzword these days in, in, in Norway for, for making that huge exp exp expansion of renewables that, that uh, the professor is talking about. and. Um, uh, just to throw out some numbers from, I think there was a government um, uh, briefing this this spring, uh, talking about uh, expanding up to fifteen hundred uh, uh, units uh, uh, offshore wind units 
in the next 20 years. Uh, we'll see if that happens. But, but these are sort of the ambitions, uh, which would take us up to, I don't know, 30,000 megawatts or something, if that actually happens. Uh, you, very ambitious. And, and of course, I mean, we have to be honest about it. Uh, not everything is uncontroversial in Norway either. It's sure, there are discussions about off onshore wind, especially with a lot of local communities asking whether they want to have um, uh, windmills in, in, in their backyard. Uh, familiar uh, issue um, here in Canada, I think. Uh, but also for 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 offshore. Uh, so, uh, but but I think, I mean, the, the whole development that we see globally and especially in Europe when it comes to the energy needs, the situation we have with Russia, mm -hmm. uh, it it points in one direction. It points in the direction of uh, wrapping up production of renewables very quickly everywhere uh, where so, it's possible. On, on on that, Ambassador, uh, one of the the. The remaining issues with renewables has to do with the sourcing of the materials and particularly the minerals and metals from problematic regions. Mm -hmm. Is Norway moving into the space of becoming more and more of um, a producer or a refiner of energy materials, of, of critical minerals and metals? Is that something that, that's also part of the energy transition in the country? And, and well, yes. You're you welcome to answer. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there there is a also uh, the the government has has a, a goal to to um, research and, and develop the uh, the mineral uh, industry. Uh, mining uh, is something we we probably will have to see more of in the future, including deep sea mining. Norway has resources, uh, I think, from from uh, for critical mineral, just like Canada, and it's actually one of the areas that where, where I would like to see uh, cooperation between Norway and Canada. Maybe there will be competition between companies in the future, but I think at this stage there will be a lot of, of synergy effects on on looking at this together, uh, as critical minerals will have to be sourced also. Um, uh, well, uh, to put it this way, uh, preferably with with friends and allies. Um, so. Um, so that's definitely a part of it for us as well. Uh, to add to that, I think you will see within these uh, renewable industries that the focus on the circular economy and, and how to, to, to do recirculation of materials and, 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 uh, and uh, some of this is well known how we can do it and it is just to implement the value chains in other cases like for uh, wind uh, for the turbine blades, uh, you need to you, you need to to also do more research and find out how you can do some of these these uh, parts more sustainable in the future. Fantastic! Yeah, there's been some really interesting and exciting advances around the whole circular economy of of mm -hmm. energy energy materials and and metals that I, I'm quite optimistic about. Um, so, Professor, I was <coughs> excuse me, I was looking around on the website of for the university. And uh, one of the focuses of the Energy Transition Center is the development, design, and implementation of the future energy market in Norway and Europe. That sounds really interesting as, as a, a, a research stream. Can you tell me more about, about that? Again, it's the development, design, and implementation of the future energy market in Norway and Europe. What is, what is the work that, that your center is doing there? Yeah, so if you look at Europe, we have a system where there is a lot of integration between the different countries in the power market so that uh, so that uh, electricity flows from, from low price area to high price area to make a balance in the system so that there are cables for import and export between countries and um, and uh, and electricity flows to very small, most needed at um, any time, and that's that's a market which we look at as an energy only market where we sell and buy energy to make the best short term use of the resources we have available at any time. And and uh, of course that's under pressure when you have high prices like we had lately, uh, which is much much higher than than you used to have. And a country with a lot of flexibility like Norway, this flexibility has a high value and. Uh, and uh, we see that um, while this is a market that's been functioning well, and in my opinion still functions very well, it puts the right price on, on a resource that is very valuable. Mm -hmm. There's also pressure because, um, because uh, the high prices uh, put an extra burden on, on households and, and it also leads to energy poverty. So I think while you could say that these energy only markets has, have been working well, uh, there is an increased focus on distribution effects of these markets, which would 
go into well normally these these power plants are owned by by municipalities or the state uh, through through companies and and it's a fair question how do you redistribute some of this wealth created from the electricity system back to um, back to the population to relief for the burden that uh, the total the total burden of taxes and and fees and and costs that that people have so i think that's a discussion we will see more of I think also we will see a discussion that goes more into the value of flexibility, so not necessarily the energy content, but the availability to provide electricity when it's needed in a flexible way. For example, when the wind uh, isn't blowing uh, or the sun isn't shining, you still would need to have that. So that flexibility, uh, in particular, if you look at short term flexibility, probably will need to to see development of more local markets where uh, households in an energy community or in a city could trade flexibility internally to solve some of the problems that earlier has been left to solve by, by more centralized systems. So that brings um, a little bit of the, um, the energy transition into the households in terms of how can you, through more active consumers, uh, help to solve bottlenecks in the system. And in this area, I think there is, is room for a lot of new market design development. How can we incentivize ordinary people to participate in that kind of flexibility markets and feel that they get something back from it? And do you have an answer to that? How do you, how but, do you incentivize ordinary people to, to participate? Yeah, I, I think uh, the standard solution of, of some of the regulators would be let's increase tariffs to motivate them to uh, to uh, to save energy when there are bottlenecks in the system. So that would be sort of the approach by the stick. Uh, yeah. I believe we need uh, markets that that have uh, more of these features of the carrot, so that we could actually incentivize in a positive way that you feel you get something back for for letting letting saying the local utility or distribution company control some of your uh, equipment like an uh, electric heater for, for the hot water. Uh, you need to feel that you get something back from that. And, and uh, in some respect, uh, this is uh, a, a challenge for the future market designs is how to make uh, uh, the provision of flexibility Advantage, advantages for ordinary people without feeling uh, a loss of comfort. Mm -hmm. I think that's possible, but, but I think we are working on the solutions on, on how to get more intelligent household appliances that could participate in that kind of, um, of markets. That's that's great. I, I like your point about getting something back. It, it may be effective if you use all sticks, but it's not pleasant to live with, that's for sure. <laughs> Related to what you're saying here, I have a question. We've heard a lot here about um, the energy plight that Germany is in and that individual Germans are facing coming for this winter with potentially not enough energy. I've seen advertisements uh, coming out of Germany about how to heat yourself with a candle and stay alive. Um, is the population in Norway facing the same sort of energy availability crisis for this winter or as an energy producer is Norway shielded or insulated from this problem at, at a sort of a household level? So I think um, the situation that we have in, in Norway right now is that most people uh, was taken a bit aback uh, by how the, the energy crisis in, in Germany, especially, but in Europe at large uh, has affected us as well. I think. The, the, the uh, general perception uh, among Norwegians would be that, you know, we have all this hydropower in abundance, uh, so we won't be affected by it. Uh, uh, and uh, I think also a very typical Norwegian way of thinking it would be, okay, we have enough, so we, we'll, we'll be fine, and then we can help others with what oh, we have left over. So that's not how, not how it works. Uh, because we're part of the, 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 uh, the energy market in Europe, and we are exporting the hydropower as well. So being a part of the market means that prices has gone up a lot mm -hmm. in Norway as well. Uh, I don't I don't have the exact figures, but it's been huge rise in energy prices and, and electricity prices. And that, as Oscar just said, you know we are uh, heavily depending on electricity for for uh, you know uh, heating as well in in, in Norwegian uh, private homes because it's always been available and, and cheap. Uh, so uh, the big picture would probably be that you know exporting uh, hydropower have served us well, uh, given huge re revenues to to both government and 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 the municipalities and so on. But in the current circumstances, um, 
it means that energy prices has gone up. So the government has needed to intervene on that, uh, and they are uh, intervening uh, right now, uh, going in with, with uh, direct subsidies to households uh, on, on the energy bills. And I think there's no, there would, was no way around that uh, because everyone knows and, and, and understands that the whole uh, ecosystem of, of producing uh, electricity in Norway is, was originally financed, you know, um, by, by taxpayers and and uh, most of the revenues goes back either to the government or, or to to the regions or the municipalities uh, so one way or another of course there are private entities as well but that that's how it works so subsidies has, has, has been necessary and, and at this point actually um, for certain parts of, of the households in southern Norway which is more heavily impacted by by this uh, issue uh, the government is now subsidizing up to 90 percent of, of, of the electricity bill um, for the time being and then we'll we'll see how this goes uh when it comes to the actual resource um access so the question of could we face uh rationing in in norway uh i don't know oscar if you have more uh to say about that it, 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 there has been talk about it uh i think for for most norwegian that would be hard to hard to imagine but but the, the point is that the energy market electricity market as it is now works the way that uh uh more or less automatically i think uh electricity from norwegian hydropower has been diverted to uh the places that that has the highest prices uh it's sort of, it's a marketplace yeah. uh yeah. so uh apparently the government will, will have to look into to to how to deal with that so to make sure that uh, we don't uh, wind up in a situation where that for most norwegians would be only not acceptable, but not understandable either. How mm. could we not have enough for ourselves? Yeah. Uh, I, I think in, in Norway, in modern times, we never were in a situation where we had rationing of, of electricity. And, and and what we could observe due to the sit situation in Europe and the high value of electricity in Europe, we could see very high prices. That's, that's somehow the, the step before rationing, where the prices themselves get up to a level which is so high that some people cannot afford electricity even if they really need electricity. And I think this is a situation where these support schemes will, will be needed. My guess and our recommendation is that when these support schemes are re-evaluated uh, and changed, uh, that they have a higher focus on energy saving and, and on energy efficiency to stimulate to that. And my guess is this will, will happen. If we would get in a situation where we would, would need, reach the maximum price in the system and the government would have to intervene and prioritize who would get electricity, that would be um, surprising if we get into that situation. Our regulators and, and uh, system operators say that it's possible, but not very likely. And it has never happened. Uh, so uh, this is, It's fascinating. I wasn't expecting these answers, honestly. So I, I think this will come as, as, as a bit of a, a surprise to, to many people mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Bringing this question more broadly, I, I have a question, as does Trisha Singh, one of our, our viewers here, on how the has the war in Ukraine and the resulting energy crisis changed? Has it changed Norway's decarbonization schedule or goals or the production that is anticipated or being taken in in terms of oil and gas? So, so more of a system level question than a than a household distribution mm -hmm. question here. Well, well, the, the the simple answer is is probably not really. I mean, what we were just talking about the 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 uh, the energy price crisis, if you would like to call it that, is of course uh, indirectly linked to to uh, to the war in, in Ukraine and what has happened in, in the market. But if you're talking about the decarbonization pol policies, uh, they have not been reversed in any way or or modified from the government. I think, it, if anything, it just tells us that we have to to work uh, more uh, intensely on 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 the, on the green transition. Uh, and I, I think there are two two effects that didn't really change the the, the political uh, the political uh, objectives, but I think that there might be more political agreement that we would need to build more renewable energy in Norway. I think yes. uh, I think think there's more political agreement that we would have to do that. I also see that if you look at European policy, I think the European policy is. Uh, leaning more towards um, a position where Europe needs more natural gas and Norway is a preferred provider of that natural gas. 
-hmm. So I think there is an increased interest in going into long-term agreements on, on exploring new natural gas resources. I mean, this, this is a temporary part of that new transition, but due to the Ukraine crisis, I, I think uh, it's, it's becoming clear that for, for some 20 years, you would, you would have a shortage of natural gas into these markets. And uh, this is also a new situation. Um, and and uh, I, I think it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how Norwegian policymakers respond to, to, to those two trends. That, that I, I think I think at, at when it comes to to the I think you were, what the, the question was also about oil and gas production mm -hmm. or gas production mm -hmm. especially and and it has been I mean it's not like Norway uh, had the possibility to increase the production immensely mm -hmm. uh, that there were that there was a lot of underproduction going on I know mm -hmm. that the government uh, did um, change some some provisions in the regulatory framework to make it possible for the operators to do a bit more. But uh, as far as I can understand, we're producing at mm. full capacity and exporting to Europe as much as possible. Yeah, it's been it's been at full capacity for years, and it's going to be at full capacity yeah. for for ten ten more years. And and yeah. after that, uh, uh, one would probably need to to explore new resources to be able to keep up this capacity if that is something that Europe would would want. Yeah. This is great. Well, I I also wanted to. Um touch on this question of polarization. Um, and, and again, it comes partially from me and partially from some of the questions that are coming up here, which is, you know, Canada is, a, it's a, we're a large country. We have regions that are oil and gas producing and regions that, that are not and very much don't understand why oil and gas is needed at all. And it's caused a lot of polarization within the country on um, whether oil and gas is needed, how much value does it have? Can we cut it out altogether? Um, and also the value of decarbonizing versus the economic pain that it would cause. Does Norway face at all any, any sort of polarization along energy transition lines? And, and if there is not any sort of polarization, what, what sort of tactics has Norway's, Norway used to bridge regional divisions and come to a consensus on the dual importance of the resources for the nation and the necessity of decarbonization? I think if you take polarization to be something else than just you know uh, political disagreement about certain issues mm -hmm. uh, the big answer is no not to the same extent that we've seen in Canada so Norway is a unitary state of a little more than five million people uh, that's different from 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 uh, a very very geographically very huge uh, federation of, of uh, a little less than 40 million people uh so the interprovincial dynamics that i'm observing here in canada is not something you would see to the same degree in norway um even if different regions um have different uh, challenges for instance we were talking about the the electricity uh problems right now well uh there seems to be enough uh electricity and, and the prices are lower in the northern part of the country than in the southern because uh of how the, the, the distribution system works. That doesn't sort of necessarily, uh, that, that's a problem for the government. I don't think it, it creates um, uh, hostility between you know the people living in those two uh, different parts of the, of the country. Uh, so uh, have there been and are there debates in Norway about how much uh, the government should do about the climate uh, change issue? how much uh, effort should be put into to adapting versus uh, stopping uh, climate change. Yes, of course, it's a debate everywhere. It's been a debate in Norway as well. Um, are there differences between the political parties when it comes to those issues? Uh, yes and no. Some parties seem to agree quite well. Some, some parties want to go much further when it comes to uh, transition. Uh, some party wants to uh, take a more conservative approach, a moderate approach. Uh, so all of these um, discussions uh, have been and, and are ongoing. Do we see polarization, which means that people are dividing themselves into two camps that do not overlap when people goes to goes to the polls? I haven't seen that so far. 
we no, have I, I think uh, I think we could say we have seen some polarization in terms of do we need more renewables and how and where should we, yes. we build that. Uh, less so in the oil and gas sector, even if you have some political parties that would like to, to stop oil and gas production more or less immediately. And I think that reflects part of the population as well. Mm. This is far from the majority. And, and I think also with the energy, energy scarcity we see in Europe these days, it's a very clear understanding that it would be very difficult for Europe to, to manage without the Norwegian natural gas in, in particular. So I think that's also increased the understanding that Europe, in fact, depends on, on, on this natural gas. We have a question here that says, what's the role of the Norge Bank in transition? It recently announced a new climate action plan to push net zero in its portfolio. I'm not sure if that's something that either of you can can speak to, but but if you know, here's your opportunity to answer. And if you don't know, we can move on. Yeah. So so if you look at the, the Norwegian pension fund global, which I assume you you're pointing to, and the investment portfolio that uh, they have they have been um, they have been. Um, Early on, on banning investments in in coal and um, and um, and they don't have a particular climate profile. Uh, I would say they have also stopped investments in oil and gas, if I remember correctly, not from a climate uh, perspective, but from a diversification perspective, because the Norwegian economy so much depends on oil and gas. Uh, but we also see uh, some interesting movements that they have been allowed to in their mandate to invest in infrastructures. And that would very often mean infrastructures that facilitate green transition. And I think that's a tremendously important mm -hmm. part of the investment strategy that this is, is uh, now allowed. So I think you would see um, uh, that it has a very responsible investment profile, but it hasn't flagged very particularly uh, a climate profile in its investment uh, strategy. But you can see a more and more sustainable uh, profile uh, if, if you look at history. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. And, 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 and getting... the, the, just, to, just to add on that, so to make that, so, so the, the, uh, the investment fund is a unit within the central bank. That's probably mm -hmm. why, why, why I pointed to the central bank. Mm -hmm. And it's managed from there, but it is, I mean, the, the, the um, is managed like like uh, an investment fund where where the uh, where the goal is to maximize mm. profits. So it's not politically yeah. controlled uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that you know the government would go in and say you know invest here and there and and, and don't invest here and there. That's not how it works. This is great. I've, because we're getting near the top of the hour, I have one final question for for both for either of you really, Professor. I'll start with you. Do you think that there's ways that Canada and Norway can work together? to promote smart low cost energy transition with a global impact i think this this uh, global efforts on some of the technologies we need to succeed in the transition is extremely important carbon capture and storage would be one of those building hydrogen value chains uh, would be another one of those uh, managing to transition offshore wind uh, into a scalable industrial uh, solution uh, it's not one of those where really this global cooperation is going to be crucial. And I think the knowledge that is built during these next few years is going to also be uh, global export products. So that the knowledge that, that is built is, is, is also going to be highly valuable. Uh, and and uh, to succeed, uh, I think there's only one way that's global cooperation in, in, uh, in, in research and industrial scale up. And, and Nova and Canada should be in a very good position to cooperate on those. Do you, do you see that as being a sort of a business to business cooperation and and, and um, or, or is it more of a government to government level cooperation that you see? Yeah, so, so what, what, what I, I think could be the government role is to facilitate, uh, for example, cooperation on research and education between uh, between countries. And you could also have some kind of industrial missions where you, you do support early industrial scale up of technologies jointly between countries. Uh, so so um, there are many ways of doing this. From, from my side, uh, coming out of research, we see huge benefits of, of uh, government support for, for joint research activities and uh, educational activities. Great. Absolutely, and, and and we are working on this from 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 our side as well. Uh, Norway, uh, twenty twenty, uh, included uh, Canada into so called Panorama Strategy, mm -hmm. which um, mm -hmm. is 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 the government strategy for working with non EU countries in education research and and. Uh, 
there are, are funding going with that and, and we are trying to promote that here in Canada to, to get more research cooperation. There is a lot going on actually, but it could be even more. So I agree mm, on that. Indeed. And also we, we are working, we are now looking into to the maritime clusters on both coasts. We have a uh, huge experience with that in Norway. So the whole marine tech side of, mm. of, of a green transition is something where uh, there should be huge potential for, for cooperation mm. in the future. Of course, business to business, uh, absolutely. But we can support that business to business cooperation from, from both governments if we want to. And, and, and we are certainly for one trying to, to do that. Fantastic. Well, on that positive note, thank you both so very much for showing up this morning. I should also mention that if you want to come and see the ambassador in person in Calgary next week or virtually, there's an event that's being hosted next Thursday by, Thursday by the University of Calgary called the Nordics and NATO, the new normal balancing global security. I see this balance is, is uh, coming out of a bit as a bit of a theme. So uh, that's that's happening at the UFC. And if you're not sure where it is, you can also email us and we'll be happy to, to refer, refer you to how you can sign up to that. So thank you both very, very much. And to all of you who, who took the time out of your Friday morning to come and listen, thank you as well. Um, that is it over and out for this webinar. Thank you so much.